Less than a year after two cores of radioactive metal killed hundreds of thousands of Japanese in the waning days of World War II, another pit of plutonium, also intended to explode like a rising sun over Japan, would kill again. First, it would claim the life of young American physicist Harry Doglian Jr. Then it would end the ride of so-called nuclear cowboy Louis Slotin. Both men died during criticality experiments gone awry. They tickled the dragon's tail, as Richard Feynman put it, and paid the price. In both instances, however, these two men had the presence of mind to immediately disassemble their deadly mistakes. But what if they hadn't? What if this demon core stayed in a catastrophically critical arrangement? Would it stay deadly forever? Would it explode like a nuclear bomb? We actually have some ideas about this counterfactual. Because it's happened before. This is the true story of the criticality accident in Sarov, Russia. Criticality describes the point at which a nuclear chain reaction is self-sustaining. During nuclear fission, it's when each split atom produces just enough neutrons to split at least one additional atom on average. For an operating nuclear reactor, criticality is a good thing. It's where you want to be. However, reactors want a certain kind of critical. During a fission event, two types of neutrons are produced. Over 99% of them are so-called prompt neutrons the neutrons produced from the splitting of the atom itself. The second kind of neutron comes from what's left over after the fission, from fission products that emit neutrons much later, sometimes minutes after the reaction. These are the delayed neutrons, and even though they account for only a tiny fraction of the neutrons flying around a nuclear reactor's core, it's these that allow nuclear engineers to control it. If a reactor core is built to only go critical with the help of delayed neutrons, particles that can take minutes to appear, it means that relatively slow mechanical systems like control rods have enough time to adjust criticality. Nuclear reactors are therefore delayed critical assemblies, because prompt critical nuclear reactions happen in just nanoseconds and can't be controlled in the same way, unless you want a catastrophic release of energy. Nuclear weapons are engineered to be prompt critical, meaning that they use the first neutrons from fission to create as many fission events as possible before the material literally blows itself apart. That's why nuclear weapons engineering is more than just the nuclear material. The time scale for prompt neutrons is so small that a bomb has to create a suitable environment for the nuclear material where an uncontrolled exponential growth of neutrons and energy can actually occur. In a bomb like was dropped on Nagasaki, that was achieved by using conventional explosives to precisely compress a subcritical sphere of plutonium into a prompt critical mass. If the implosion isn't perfectly spherical, material could be ejected or not undergo fission at all, and that means a much less powerful explosion. A lot of good engineering goes into these terrible weapons. Implosion or impact isn't the only way to create prompt criticality. In 1945 and 46, Harry Doglian Jr. and Louis Slotin were seeing how close they could get to the tipping point by placing neutron reflectors around a 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium. This, in effect, was like having more fissile material in a smaller space. Neutrons that would be ordinarily lost to space are instead reflected back into the material and are able to create a chain reaction that otherwise wouldn't happen. Doglian Jr. did this with tungsten carbide bricks. Slotin did it with half-spheres of beryllium. When their hands slipped on the days they became dead men walking, the plutonium core went prompt critical almost instantly. They saw a flash of blue light and felt a wave of heat. They would both die of complications from acute radiation poisoning in the same hospital attended to by the same nurse. These were history's most famous criticality accidents. The fact that it was the very same sphere of plutonium, the demon core, in the very same experiment, is why this story is so infamous. It's perfect sci-fi. It's human hubris meets physics, the irresistible allure of Pandora's box. But 
it could have been worse. What if both men didn't immediately fix their errors when they removed the reflectors that initiated prompt criticality? What if instead they both had the totally reasonable reaction of just running out of the room as quickly as possible? What would the Demon Core have done? How would you stop it? How would you fight an awoken dragon spewing blue fire in the next room? On June 17, 1997, 41-year-old Alexander Zakharov was putting together a criticality experiment assembly, as he had done many times before. He was working in Sarov, Russia, the sister city to Los Alamos, and the town where Russia made its first atomic bomb. The assembly was a highly enriched uranium core surrounded by neutron reflectors, much like the Demon Core. This setup was a little bit more controlled than a screwdriver, however. The top reflector was fixed in place, and the core and bottom reflector could be moved up and down remotely. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the operator had successfully performed hundreds of criticality experiments, but like Harry Doglian Jr. decades before, on this day, he decided to work alone, in violation of safety procedures. The top reflector slipped, there was a flash of light, a wave of heat, and apparently enough energy from prompt criticality to eject the bottom of the apparatus downwards into the bottom of the stand. Alexander left the room quickly, closed the doors, and found his superiors. All the while, the assembly sat quiet and still critical in the center of the experiment hall. The first estimation of Alexander's full-body dose was 10 grays. 50% chance of death, even with medical care, starts at around 2 grays. His hands may have been hit with 1,600. A critical core is not necessarily a nuclear bomb. That's why criticality testing is possible in the first place. It's a way to study fission reactions as they might occur in a nuclear reactor. In fact, when a core like that in Sarov is made critical by precisely positioning the core between reflectors, it's very much like a small nuclear reactor. And it regulates itself. The chain reactions inside create heat, and that heat causes the materials of the assembly to expand, and this changes the geometry of the experiment, lowering reactivity. You can see this in the spikes of neutrons as the setup physically expands and contracts. Eventually, the core stabilizes to some constant state of neutron emission through surfaces, or flux. The worst case scenario for a setup like this is that criticality is quickly surpassed, and the chain reaction goes exponential. Now the heat generated is enough not to just expand material, but melt it. A melted core would create a serious amount of radiation and radioactive contamination, but turning a nuclear sphere into a nuclear puddle would also be enough of a change in geometry that the chain reaction would stop. It's another kind of failsafe that Sarov planned for, with walls of concrete several meters thick. So, a criticality accident is not a nuclear warhead in Potentia. That requires taking a subcritical core to supercritical in fractions of a second, and the experiments at Sarov and at Los Alamos in the 1940s simply weren't set up like implosions or guns. Less than one hour after the accident, Alexander Zakharov was in a hospital, vomiting. His hands were swollen and turning red. By the third day, now in a specialized hospital in Moscow, doctors could hear a bubbling sound in his lungs. Cells in his bone marrow were dead. Zakharov died from apparent heart failure just 66 hours after exposure to the critical core in Sarov. At the same time, the core was still there, in that room. Pulsing with a neutron flux, no one knew how to get near. Because of the precise geometries and materials needed, it should be easy enough to stop a critical core. Both Harry Doglian Jr. and Louis Slotin were able to do so by simply slapping away the offending reflector that killed them. But for an event like that in 1997, where no one is there to make the ultimate sacrifice, there's a catch. Anything you approach the constantly fissioning core with, machine, person, robot, actually increases the reactivity of the core. Human bodies aren't the best neutron reflectors, but they are sizable enough and reflect some, and that's enough to add to the chain reaction you want to stop. 
Specialists in Sarov therefore had a puzzle to solve even after Alexander Zakharov's death. How do you affect the core remotely, without using anything large for shielding? Plasma cutter? Controlled explosion? Ultimately, Sarov scientists use a robot with a suction cup to separate the assembly, even though it caused the neutron flux to spike 300%. By the time the core was finally moved and was emitting nothing above background radiation on June 24, 1997, it had been lethally critical for over a week. Thus ended Sarov's third criticality accident. The radiological accident in Sarov, Russia is a near direct answer to what would have happened if the demon core was never stopped. It's possible there could have been a rapid release of energy large enough to blow the assembly apart ending the reaction. But it wouldn't be a nuclear explosion. Or it could have melted down, also ending the reaction. Or, as actually happened in 1997, it could have sat there at some deadly equilibrium of heat and neutron flux while Los Alamos scientists figured out what to do next. Given that neither Doglian Jr. or Slotin's locations were heavily shielded like Sarov's, it stands to reason that history's most infamous criticality accident could have been a lot worse. The Demon Corps could have irradiated a lot more people, and for longer, had Doglian and Slotin not immediately fixed their final mistakes. I'm well aware that in telling you these stories, it likely changes your visceral response to nuclear physics and engineering. Yes, the tale of the Demon Corps is an ominous one. It's unsettling, almost supernatural. But these stories are also relatively rare, it needs to be pointed out that while nuclear accidents are flashy, the nuclear industry as a whole is extremely safe. Adding up all the fatalities from radiological accidents in the nuclear industry's entire history, and you get an undisputed minimum number of around 150. In the United States alone, it was estimated that between 2014 and 2019, there were around 100 deaths in the oil and gas industry per year. Think about all the scary stories you've heard about the Demon Core, the Elephant's Foot, Chernobyl, Fukushima. Realize that all of those accidents, all of them, in total, are eclipsed by a little more than a single year of oil and gas industry accidents. We've decided as a society to ignore this comparison, but the future of clean energy depends on us not doing so. Our ignorance here, however, isn't entirely our fault. The nuclear industry has what I call a black box problem where the public broadly understands what goes into and comes out of a nuclear plant, but everything on the inside seems intentionally obscured and mysterious. I butted up against this problem firsthand when walking around the Chernobyl exclusion zone. It was my first nuclear trip. We were embedded with a group of scientists, engineers, and first responders learning on the ground in Chernobyl. I told one of them, a criticality specialist, about my video on the Demon Corps the very first video in this series. She asked me, So, what do you think happened to it? The core itself, I asked. I said the public story is that it had either been used in a nuclear bomb test or was reintegrated into the U.S. stockpile. Oh, is that what the public thinks happened? She declined to say another word about it. Until next time.